Good morning. You know, uh, I asked that we'd sing that song. It's sort of been a song for me for the last season or so. And then today, as we're singing it right before I'm going to come speak, I thought that might not have been the best song. It says, uh, I'm finding myself at a loss for words. (laughs) And the funny thing, that's okay. The last thing I need is to be heard. Let's go to lunch. <laughs> I mean, I mean, really. But really, I do think this, uh, let me pray in just a minute. Uh, I think we come together and we hear things from each other. Sometimes it's while we're in the greeting. Sometimes it's in the lyrics of the songs. Sometimes it's in the unity prayer, or it's in the communion thoughts, or it's in Steve's announcements. Uh, Everywhere, I think there's the potential for us to hear the word of God, and and not just in the life-changing word of God. And so... We all come with different kinds of things going on in our lives. Uh, Some of us have trouble in our lives. Anybody? Yeah? I know you do, Sally, even though you didn't raise your hand. (laughs) Some of us have just great, we had just a great week and we're kind of celebrating things are good. Things are good. And some of us are distracted by what's coming ahead. But, but there's, I believe that God's going to speak to us. He's already spoken to us. And so this prayer is for us to listen and uh, for me to not talk too much. <clears throat> Let's pray. God, we do believe that you speak to us. You guide us, you comfort us, you encourage us, you challenge us. I pray today that might be what happens in the next few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in the book of James, and if you have a Bible, it's handy, because I'm going to kind of read through it. James, thir- James 5, verse, starting at verse, whoop, James 3, starting at verse 13. Sally gave me that. No, no, no. So uh, I, I want to start just with the way it starts. Who is wise among you? So look around the room. Who is wise among us? You know, if sometimes I'll do this thing. I may not do it today. But, you know, maybe. Uh, where I'll ask something about, like, uh, who is uh, the best uh, 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 singer in the group, and I'll say, on the, point, on the count of three, point to somebody. Well, I'm not going to do that right now. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Betty, for going anyway, you know. I love an engaged kind of audience here. It's great. But, but who, who is wise among us? You know, that there's an implication there. Hey, there's some wise people here. I believe it. You know, sometimes we believe and think that older people are wiser. I don't know. I've met a lot of old fools. I've met a lot of really wise young people. But, but wise people, older people do have a chance, a little better chance, because they've lived longer and perhaps they learned You know, the worst thing is when you live longer and you don't learn, or you learn it wrong. So, but ask the question, who is wise um, among us? And and I think what James is wanting us to say is, hey, we all have that opportunity. And then he encourages those who are wise, so let's just say we all are for a moment. And he says this, let them show it by their good life. By deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Now, the 
The point of this reading is going to focus on wisdom. But right here is this idea of humility comes from wisdom. Humility comes from wisdom. A humble person, if you've got humility, you've gotten it from wisdom. Wisdom. And that your deeds are done in wisdom and in humility. It's not, whoa, look at me. But, but, but rather, let my deeds be done in humility. Humility coming from wisdom. So what James does next, he, he describes, he contrasts two kinds of wisdom. There's a worldly kind of wisdom. We're going to read about it. And then there's a godly kind of wisdom. And I want us to begin, even right now, and the, the last slide is going to talk about an inventory, doing a wisdom inventory of yourself. But begin that even right now. Which describes you of these kinds of wisdom? Because there's a lot of ways that our world around us describes different things, like success. What does success mean? I was interested in that just like... Uh, what, what does it mean for an individual to be successful? What does it mean for a church to be successful? What does that mean? But, but also this idea of wisdom. Uh, the, the idea of wisdom. What is wise in the eyes of our world that lives around us that aren't Jesus followers? Okay, well, James jumps right in it. It's worldly, demonic wisdom. It's Full of bitter envy and selfish ambition. I'm interested in words, you know, and I, so I look at different translations. All of them use the word demonic. Wisdom of the world comes from the evil one. We're deceived into thinking one thing is wise and another isn't. But here's, here's the, the kicker. Bitter envy. What is this? I, I, I'm, I'm calling it you know, bitter envy is when I'm frustrated, I'm angry, and I'm angry because I want what I can't have, which James is going to talk about next week, but I want, I want mine, everything that's mine, but I also want yours too, because actually I like yours, I like mine, and I would like yours. Well, we walked in today, uh, Shanna and I. We walked in, and there was another RAV4 out in the parking lot. I would like a RAV4. And I would like that RAV4 for a while until I saw Steve's Corvette. <laughs> then I would want the Corvette for a while. Then I would drive it around for a while, and I'd think, nah, I don't like being down this low. I want Steve's truck. <laughs> you know, it's, I want, and I want, and I want. But not only do I want more, and I want what you've got, not just what I've got, I also, I'm, I'm hacked off about it. I'm bitter. And I and I'll walk around looking and seeing, and everything I see, I'm frustrated by it because I can't share in another person's joy that they've got a RAV4. <laughs> you know why? I want one. So I have this bitter envy. That's the world's view of, because here's what that lead that leads to, it leads to the next thing, selfish ambition. And selfish ambition is criticized a lot, but you know what? Ambition often will lead a person to what the world also calls success. Man, you want a driven person to run. If I'm a football, if I'm a athletic director hiring a new football coach, you know what I want one? I want him to be ambitious because that is, Ambition's going to drive him to success, what the world would call success. But it's selfish ambition that is unhappy and unsatisfied with both my identity and, and, and not only that, my position in life. I want, there's a ladder in our world. We think of this ladder philosophy mentality of life. And what I want is the next step on it. What I want is not just the RAV4. I want the best, the most expensive. I want, I want to move up. 
Uh, and, and so we're not satisfied. And, and we think that more stuff or a better position, I want a promotion, is going to make me happy. But it, it's not going to. And so we become this bitter, envious person. And, and we think of this, that all of my talents, this selfish, ambition person, and we think of all the talents and gifts and resources that I have, they're, they're, they're for me to use to promote me. Selfish ambition. It's also, there's a religious version of that. And the religious version of that is expressed in judgment of others. Selfish ambition. I'm better than you are, and I'm right, and you're not, and I do things better than you, and you're not quite us. It's, it's, a, it's judgment. Uh, anybody who doesn't agree with the way I do things at church or in my Christian life, well, they're wrong. And, th and that's the religious verse. But here's the, another one. I, I thought of this phrase. This phrase just came to me as I was listening to the song, Word of God Speak. The phrase, the self-made man. Have you ever thought about the idolatry of that phrase? Think about that for a second. The self-made man. I mean, the self-made Bob. Wait a minute. Bob didn't make himself in any kind of way. And yet we all often admire what our culture calls the self-made man. What an arrogant statement as well. I'm just leaving that statement alone because I'm not sure what to think about it. But then James goes on. He says, this is what this worldly kind of wisdom is. But there is a wisdom that comes from God. And so I want to say this, if it's not this in each one of these, if it's not this, it's not from God. So first of all, he says, it's pure. It's pure. Wisdom from God is pure. Now, I want to describe pure in this way, the way that uh, I think James is meaning it. He uses this phrase double-minded, and that also will be brought up next week in chapter 4. He also used it back in chapter 1. A pure heart is one who has just one focus. Okay, so, so you think about it like this. If you're going, it's a wedding, and you're going up there, and you have, I'm the groom, and here's my bride, and I also have another bride. It's hard for that kind of person who has two brides to have a pure heart. I just got one thing, one focus. I'm not double-minded. I don't have two agendas. I just have one. The double-minded person is not wise. They are not pure. The double-minded person, in terms of following Jesus, has a plan B. Jesus' followers don't have plan B. I've got one plan. Follow Jesus. That's it. I don't have something to fall back on. Plan B, none. There is none. I just, I'm all in with Jesus, pushed all my chips in. I'm going to follow Jesus. You know, if it doesn't work out, I'm still going to follow Jesus. Because what does it mean, is it going to work out? Am I going to be a, have a comfortable life? Maybe not. Is all of my life going to be a party? Maybe not. He promises me joy, but sometimes he promises me hardship. So when I want to jump off the ship right off the bat because... Well, I'm not pure-minded if I've got plan B. The second thing, if it's not peace-loving, it's not from God. And when I say peace-loving, I think of kind. And other translation would put kind there. It says, when engaging conflict or trouble, am I peace-loving? I'm going to have conflict, but am in the conflict, am I a peace-loving person? Am I a kind person? You know, you can be kind in a conflict without being, uh, without aggressive, what we call last week, smack talk, right? And you can tell the truth and still be kind. You can tell the truth and still be kind. Some people think that, well, you know, I've got to be, tell the truth, and sometimes the truth is hard. Well, sometimes the truth is hard, but you can tell a hard truth in a kind way. Wisdom from above is Peace loving. It's also this. It's, whoops, back to, it's considerate. And when I say that, I want to say like, 
Like Isaiah 42 said this. Isaiah 42 says this is how Jesus is going to come. He's going to bring justice. But when he comes, it says, verse 2 says he's going to not shout. He's not going to raise his voice. He says a bruised reed he will not break. He's going to be gentle. Even as he says, but in faithfulness, he will still bring judgment. I mean, excuse me, justice. Justice. You can be kind and gentle and still address things that are problematic. You can address things that are not true. You can have patience and forgiveness for others. Some, some, I have a friend who's just really reemphasized this truth in my life. When we're in conflict, when we're disagreeing with each other, can we be considerate and consider this most of all? Our enemy, our debate partner, is not, our enemy is not flesh and blood. If they're our enemy, they're not flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. So my friend Lee, Lee teaches a Bible study that I go to in Abilene, and it's at a rehab facility. And so he's the leader of this rehab facility. And part of his own story is this. He didn't come a, become a Christian until he was in his 30s. As he says, the way it happened, he said, God breathed on my face. And I just had to find out more about that. And so uh, as a child, though, his mom, uh, his dad was a drug addict, and he became one. His mom uh, ran a porn store. And he lived right behind it. From the time he was nine years old until he was 15 years old, he and his mother had a sexual relationship on a regular basis. He grew up with that. He said he was 12, almost 13, when she quit coming to his room and he started going to her room. And he was later became a person in the drug, illegal drug industry. He was kind of the middleman most of the time. Grew up in Dallas. And he said, <clears throat> for years, I hated my mom. I hated what she had done to me. And then I met Jesus. And he taught me that my enemy, who had been all my life my mom, my enemy is not my mom. Um, my enemy was the evil things that she did. And that my mom also grew up in an abusive home. That my grandmother abused my mom. And that I came to forgive her and think of her as a woman I love, not a woman I hate. Because I was, I considered where she had come from. Wisdom is considerate. It considers the other person that we're engaged with. It considers their point of view. It considers their background. It considers the trouble that they've had and the trouble that they still do. It considers the fact that they are sons and daughters of God. Lee says, my mom is a daughter of God. She doesn't know it still. The next one is submissive. And as you read more of uh, different translations or versions of this, submiss submissive, whoops, meaning open to reason, meaning uh, the New Living, that's the English Standard Version says open to reason. The NLT says willing to yield to others. The idea is you're in a conflict and you're, it's okay to see the other person's point of view. And you know what? Maybe they're right. Have any of you ever been wrong in your life? Okay, now I want you to think about something you really firmly think is true. And what if you were wrong about that? You later come to look back at yourself. Oh my goodness, I was wrong. My dad, one of my dad's favorite people when we first moved to Abilene and started going to Highland Church of Christ... 
was one of the elders named Art Haddix, and he was also in charge of the Herald of Truth, which at that time was getting a lot of flack because this is the early 70s, and the thing that Highland and the Herald of Truth were preaching was about two, two things that really flustered a lot of other of their Church of Christ brethren, uh, grace and the Holy Spirit. And so uh, a lot of donors decided that they weren't going to do that anymore, but they wanted to talk to the leaders first, and they'd go talk to Art. And, you know, there was threats, we're not going to fund you anymore because, you know, you have this unholy idea about grace. And for sure, you know, the Holy Spirit is in these letters in this book, and that's it. And, and Art said, so are you going to change your mind? And Art would say, no, I'm not. We're going to keep teaching what we think is right, but I want you to know. And this is how it ended to everyone. You may be right. What if you took that into a conflict? The idea that, you know, you may be right. I don't think you're right. I'm not going to live my life based on what you think is right because I think something. But what if I was this open to someone else's idea? Not coming in, boom, with a hammer like it's my way or the highway. I'll try it. You may be right. That's wisdom from God. If you don't have that, if you have this stubborn idea that you're always right and you're never wrong, that's not from God. That's not wisdom from God. The next is uh, you're full of mercy. It says to be full of mercy, which we've talked about forgiveness a lot. So I'm just going to say full of mercy would be not that you've got a second chance, not even a third chance. But when you're full of mercy, well, it says, Jesus said 70 times 7. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to forgive you again. I know you did it again. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to set boundaries. But I'm going to forgive you. Full of, full of mercy. Next one is impartial. And, you know, we've talked about favoritism a couple of, well, for several weeks we talked about favoritism. Amen, Jeremy? And uh, we went at it, and Jeremy went at it. And the idea is... You know, whether you are black or white, whether you're rich or you're poor, whether you're educated or uneducated, whether you're from, you know, if you're a Red Sox fan or whatever, how unholy could that be? We love you. We love you. It's not, there's no impartiality, no favoritism. Next is sincere. The idea about being sincere, uh, I can trust you and I can trust your motives. Uh, some people, you, well, here's what I'd say. A, a sincere person is not manipulative. You know how sometimes you might want to do the right thing, but you've got the wrong motive in mind. I know this is me often because I love to help people. But one of the reasons I love to help people, and I have to check myself regularly, is because I want them to like me, and I want them to give me some praise, and I want them to tell me I'm a good guy. And that's not my motive. That's not really sincere. I'm helping you because, you know, helping you helps me. That's not a sincere motive. Helping people is always good. But a sincere, wise person doesn't do it for ulterior, selfish motives. I want to back up one because I missed one. Sally didn't wave me down. But uh, wise people also produce good fruit. And I would say this especially means in this context, the context of putting the words of Jesus into practice. Jesus would say that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He said, a wise person is one who builds his house on the rock, which means putting my teachings into practice. Back in, uh, I'm going to end up with a question here. Back when I was a kid, and we moved from church to church to church because not we were church hopping, but we were moving from city to city to city, dad in the army. And what we did in those days, and I don't know if anybody had this uh, happen to you before, or when you moved from one church to another, this happened, but... What they would expect would be a letter from your church you're moving from 
to the church you're moving to. And, and they just called it, do you have your letter? That's it. They just called it the letter. You know, uh, what le- I was uh, as a little kid thinking, what is that? Well, like, I hope we have one. Yeah. <laughs> do we have a letter, Mom? Yeah, we got a letter. You know, we moved from San Antonio to Dallas and then back. We had, you had to have a letter. And what is a letter of recommendation? But what if we did that right here in this room? Are your good, are you, are you good fruit? Can I see that good fruit? And, and the good fruit being patient and kind. And the good, it's the fruit of the Spirit. But it's also putting the teachings of Jesus into practice. Being generous and being forgiving. These things that Jesus said in, in the sermon that we should do. So, uh, skipping over that. Uh, now I saw that I did. Now I'm back to this. Sincere. And, and this idea of doing the right thing for the right reason, that my heart is good in it, not manipulative. And then it ends that this is wise, wise people are peacemakers. I want to read just, just again, and I'm, I'm so, this happens so many times that Dr. Ray has been reading my mail, you know, or vice versa. I want you to think he's reading mine, but whatever. Corinthians, right? The Corinthians. Paul writes to them in 2 Corinthians. says, so from now on, we don't regard people from human point of view. Once we regarded Christ in that way, but we don't do it any longer. So if anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come and the old has gone away. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Man, if you're in this room and you're believing in Jesus, you've got a job. You've got a mission. You've got a purpose. It's the ministry of reconciliation. We're all ministers in here. Who's a minister? We all are. Of what? Reconciliation. We're peacemakers. And I want you to think about this. When you walk into the room and there's a discussion going on, is it more likely to be more peaceful because you showed up? I think that's who we are, whether it's just a conversation at home with our family, whether it's at work, wherever it may be, that because we are involved, peace is on the way. I want to say, man, there's sometimes I'm in a deal and there's somebody I don't want to show up. You know what I mean? Because they're going to be gas on the fire. But there's some people I just hope they show up quickly. I just hope they show up quickly. And sometimes they, you know, I'm the one who needs to be doused with water because I'm the fire who's lit up. Have you ever gotten into an argument you wish you weren't in and and you know it right at the, you're in it and you can't, you know, I'm like, oh, I wish my mouth wouldn't have said that. Uh, And and I need somebody to be a peacemaker. I need somebody who's going to say, now, guys, you know, isn't it a nice day outside? One time, Dad and I were having an argument, and Dad is the person I can get most fired up about or with, and him and me too, probably. And Mom, we're sitting at the table, and there's a big window behind our table, and my back is to the window, and Dad's on the side, and Mom's straight across from me. He said, and she, we're in the middle of going at it, and she says, oh, look at those birds. <laughs> I'm like... Not very subtle, but effective. You know, not subtle, but effective. Look at those birds. And you know, with mom's voice, I'm like, oh gosh, you know, I need to shut. That, that, what she meant is shut up, but she said it, you know, look at those birds. Man, we all need to be peacemakers because that's our mission. That's who we are. Last thing I want you to do is think about these two ways to kind of do an inventory self-check here. Answering these two questions. When I'm, when I'm involved with a relationship with another person or any endeavor that I might be involved in, these two competing philosophies. Jesus, how can I help? I walk in the room, I want to ask the question, how can I help? Or the worldly wisdom I walk in the room and I'm thinking right now, hmm, what's in it for me? How can I use these people or I can use this situation to promote myself? 
Worldly wisdom is based on that what's in it for me philosophy. The wisdom of God is, worth, is based on how can I help you? How can I advance you? How can I help our world? How can we do something together that gives glory to God? And the, the, the problem is, and this is going back to my friend Lee. Lee says he was, the first time he was molested, he was five. He grew up thinking that was normal. And so many of the things we have also come to believe, like this worldly way of thinking, what's in it for me? There's some Christians that think that's a good, good way to live. Because it's so normal. And what God's saying, I'm, trying, I'm giving you a new way to think. That first part of 2 Corinthians 4, I mean 5, is you're a new creation. And what James is trying to say is, this is how the new creation thinks. And, and so there's a place where we need the God's Holy Spirit, where Bob needs to shut up, and we need to listen to God as he makes us new people. I used to do it this way, but not anymore. I used to think this was wise, but now I've come to see that being submissive, not always being the, having to be the winner in the argument, that's wise, that's good. I, I have a new way to live. And this is what James has marked out for us. It's also what this song's about, so we're going to sing it, and I'll have a final word after that. The bridges in this song, if you believe it, if you receive it, what does it say to do? Man, you guys live a testimony. One way or another, whatever it is, I believe our testimony will change our workplace, change our home, change the environment, change our city, change our world. Your testimony. Because you're a wise person. The Spirit of God lives in you. So let's testify. Amen. <laughs>